Well, it's good to see each of you again. Uh, glad you're tuned in. I hope you didn't leave during the technical difficulties. And again, we're very grateful for all the work that the guys have done. And um, I think whenever you're working with technical things like that, you expect some, uh, some difficulties, but we're learning and it's become a little more complicated uh, as we've gone, and uh, but uh, the men have really done a wonderful job. Well, tonight we're going to uh, do the final uh, part of our study on envy. We've looked at the stronghold of envy, and tonight we're uh, going to be addressing the conquering of en envy. We started this last week, uh, the first week um, we dealt primarily with what causes it and why it's so such a, a serious sin. And we even saw how there are so many people in Scripture that are, it says, we're guilty of envy. And so we don't want to ever diminish it or minimize the seriousness of it in God's eyes. Uh, no sin is uh, innocent in God's eyes. And because we're all sinners, we have our own besetting sins. We can't point our finger at somebody else. We have to, first of all, point the finger at ourselves. Well, how does one conquer envy? We started that last week, and it's continuing tonight. And I, I, I want to remind us each week of what envy is and how it differs from jealousy. If you were here at church with me right now, I'd actually have people tell me and uh, join in in defining what that difference is. But since you aren't, I'll give it to you. We saw that jealousy is caused by the fear of losing something we already have. And it's especially understood when one fears losing the love of a spouse to another. And uh, there's a jealousy there. And jealousy can be a good thing. In certain circumstances, God, it says, is a jealous God. And it's not wrong um, for us to be jealous of one's spouse if someone else is trying to win their affections. Whether uh, that spouse returns the affection or not. We're, we're guarding, we're protecting, we're jealous because we're in a covenant relationship and that's not to be broken. And... God is in a covenant relationship with us and he is jealous of our love for something else. And that's what James talks about when it talks about how the spirit within us lusteth to envy. It means it, it desires us or lusteth to jealousy. I should have used that word. So then envy is caused by wanting something that others have but we don't have, which can even promote feelings of malice towards that person because they have what we want. Let's bow forward a prayer. Father, please help me and help us to understand this important topic. It's one thing, Lord, to identify how serious envy is and the problems it causes in our lives. But it's another thing, Lord, to understand how we can conquer it. And I pray that this might be, become very clear in each of our hearts, in each of our minds. Lord, we need to understand all that you've given us to conquer envy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, review to bring us up to where we are in this matter of conquering. Last week, we addressed, first of all, that we have to understand the issues of our heart if we're going to conquer envy. Our external conduct is not so much the problem as our heart is because the external is controlled by the heart. The exter external is caused by what's going on in our heart. Facial expressions, words, conduct only reveal what's 
really driving us in our hearts. Therefore, we have to address the idolatry that's going on there. If we could put it in a phrase that is used in the Bible, but substitute one word, where your idol is, there will your heart be also. And then we saw that the conduct of others is not the cause of our envy problem, but rather, again, just reveals what is going on in our heart. The conduct of others is never the problem in regards to envy. They might not even know, and it might not be a problem for them. It, might, it, it may just be us, and in fact, it is us with whom the problem is. And then we saw that the circumstances of our past or present life are not even the problem, but rather our heart's response to those circumstances. And that's huge because many people blame, blame it on their past or uh, what they've been through, and that's why they're so envious of others. Secondly, we identified that you must agree with what God's word says about envy. And we saw that envy is actually a, a form of rebellion against God. We're not content. We want what others have. And we're angry about that. Or we're, we can't be satisfied without. We can't be happy without that. Israel, we pointed out, envied other nations. And that's what drove them away from God because they wanted what other nations had. Israel wanted to dress like the pagan nations. They, they wanted a king like the pagan nations. They wanted an army like the pagan nations had. And as long as they envied the other nations, they could not praise God from their heart. And we, often, we saw from Psalm 68, oftentimes the most envious people are the ones that have been wounded most by life. And these very people sometimes have the hardest time trusting God because in life they were bruised and wounded by those they should have been able to trust. They envy the people who grow, grew up in a normal home who had it so easy. And please understand that envy is, is not limited to those who were wounded, but envy is, is often a greater temptation because their past was not like many others. But your past doesn't have to be your identity. You are a new person in Christ. Now trust him. Don't blame your behavior on your past. We also saw that envy results from a lie or imagination of your heart that makes you think your life could be better if your circumstances were different. Therefore, you bring, every, the Bible says we're to bring everything to, into the captivity to God's lordship and truth. And so we identify the lies that we have been believing and we're honest with our sin of envy. And once we identify the lies that we've been believing, now we can exchange that with the truth of God's word. And what a huge difference that makes makes. We have to be honest with our sin of envy and look inwardly. And then we saw that in envy is fundamentally discontentment with God's purposes for our life. You will never be content as long as envy is ruling your life because it's a lie that you are believing in. It will always disappoint you. You cannot be happy and you're always just searching for this thing that will satisfy and it won't. You've got to find your contentment in God alone and not in your circumstances. And then we saw, and I believe this is a very important one, envy will never, never, never yield a good product. It will disappoint you because it's a lie. It promises happiness, but it will bring you bitter disappointment because it's based on self-centeredness 
instead of love for God and others. It robs you of thankfulness. And you have to find thankfulness in your identity in Christ and Christ's ability to satisfy your needs. This is the message of James 3, 14 through 16. And it, it talks about the wisdom that is from God and the wisdom that is uh, really earthy, earthling. It's earthly and it's demonic and it's from Satan. And it talks about strife and envy and where strife and envy are, there's every evil thing. And you'll find in scripture that those two often go together, strife and envy, because envy causes strife. See, envy will bring out the worst in you, not the best. And as long as you're believing the lie, you will justify your sinful behavior. It can never yield you what you want. It will disappoint you every time. And friend, if you've been struggling with envy, the question to ask is, are you convinced of these truths that the Bible gives us, or are you still distrusting of these truths? And that leads us into the third thing, and now we're going into newer territory here. Uh, we stopped uh, right before this. And so Roman numeral three is repent of the sin of envy. First John 1, 8, and 9, we're very familiar with, most, mostly familiar with. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is freedom when we have forgiveness. But notice what verse 8 says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If, if, we're, if we reject that we are sinning by envy, if we're not willing to identify that, then the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves. And as long as we're deceived, we can never have what God wants us to have. It promises happiness, but it'll bring you the bitter disappointment. So what do we need to do? Confess the I ideal of envy in your heart, or the idol, I should say, the idol of envy in your heart and the behavior it has produced. Confess that idol of envy that has hurt others. It's hurt you, it's hurt others. And then confess the idol of envy in your heart to those that you have hurt by your actions. Now, let me caution you here. I'm not saying that whenever you've had envy in your heart, you need to confess that to those that you envy. If your en envy was only in your heart and you didn't manifest that to that person by your conduct or your words, then you don't need to confess it to them. It's between you and God. But if, if you have sinned against that person outwardly by your words or by your actions, actions of malice or, or envy, then that means that you need to go back and confess it to them as well and acknowledge it because that's part of the freedom of, from that sin. It's acknowledging it before them. It's saying that, you know, this is why I treated you, because I was envious of you. It's wrong. It's sinful. It's wicked. It's of Satan. It's not of God. And I, I want to be done with it. And I just want to ask your forgiveness for treating you in that way. And that is freeing. It may be a husband. It may be a son or daughter. It may be a wife. It may be a brother or sister in the Lord. It may be a mom and dad or maybe just a friend. But it really does begin at repentance. Remember that the scriptures say that if those that confess and forsake their sin will have freedom from God. And that's found in Proverbs 28, 13, a wonderful verse. Then Roman numeral 4 
be sure you are a child of God. Now, I put this in here because I don't want to take anything for granted. Some people may want to be a Christian not because they see themselves as sinful and in need of a, of a Lord and Savior, but because they think this quote-unquote ideal Christian home will fulfill their idolatrous goal of having that respectable, normal, loving home that they have always wanted. And friend, that's not the same as being saved. That's not the same as being a Christian and knowing Christ as your Savior and Lord. Maybe the Christian life, at least your idea of the Christian life, hasn't been working for you because you're trying to have a Christian home without Christ living in you and changing you. It's not you trying to change everyone around you. That's, that's not the Christian life. And that'll only bring conflict. That'll bring strife because it's being motivated by envy. It's not because Jesus Christ has let you down that, but rather it's that we have not trusted in Christ. Your heart is still convinced that it's your circumstances rather than a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Friends, we can't fake a living relationship with Christ. It's impossible. Even with Christ and the Holy Spirit living with our life, there's that constant tension between our flesh and and the Spirit of God that lives within us. But if you're without the Spirit of God, you're going to be frustrated beyond measure. If you try to make a Christian home without Jesus Christ, it will fail. Proverbs 23, 17 says this. Listen closely. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. Now, what does that mean, be zealous for the fear of the Lord? Well, let me put it in a, I think, in a, in a definition that we can at least understand. Fear, the fear of God is a reverence for God. It is a fear, but it is, it is really more grounded in this deep reverence and respect and love that we have for God. So, it's a deep reverence for God and His glory that is motivating you. We have to ask that question. Is it a deep reverence for God and His glory that's motivating us, or is it this ideal of a life that you never had? Which is it? See, one is an idol the other is God himself. And it's really important that we identify which of those it is. I hope you realize what I'm doing right now. You remember at the very beginning of this How to Conquer Envy, we said, the first thing we said is you've got to examine your heart. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do right now is give us those tools that help us understand our heart and measure what's going, in on, going on in our hearts. Questions re require us to examine our heart, our motives, and everything that makes us do what we do. It's not my place to condemn you because I don't know your heart. And I'm a sinner just like you are. But I can encourage you to ask questions of your own heart and allow yourself, allow the Holy Spirit to examine you through the mirror of God's word. Is it envy that is motivating you or is it the gospel of Jesus Christ revealing your sins and embracing you with Calvary love and cleansing you from all sin? Is that what is motivating you? 
because your identity is in Jesus Christ, who in Ephesians 2 says he longs to lavish you with his grace and love throughout all eternity and the ages to come. Those are powerful things to think about. Is it more important you to to please that God who gave his son to die for you? Is it more important for you to please that person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, who loved you so much that he gave his life for you so that your identity now could be in him and you're so loved by him? Not because that comes from you, but it's because of God's purpose to take you and love you and make you all that he wants you to be. Relish your new nature in Christ if you are a new creature in Christ. If you're not, if as you examine the motives of your heart, you find that that those things are not you can't identify with those. Then you need to examine whether you truly are saved. Is that an enigma to you? Letter B, I want to make this clear. You can be a Christian and still struggle with envy. Or else Paul wouldn't have been talking to Christians when he said, don't envy. And this was brought up in the context of believers. That is, topics, the different uh, references to envy in the New Testament. Envy is carnal behavior. It's not spirit-filled behavior, it's carnal behavior. Paul said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and believing, or I'm sorry, behaving like mere men? And mere men means unbelievers who don't have the Spirit of God living within them. He's not saying you don't have that. He's saying, though, that you're not living under the control of the Spirit of God. You're living by your carnal nature rather than your new nature in Christ. So envy may be the mark of a carnal Christian or it may be the mark of an unbeliever who has never repented of his sin against Jesus Christ. He has always looked at what others have done to him as more serious than his own sin. And a new believer, or I should say a believer can do that as well. He can fall into sin. He can be deceived by the lies of Satan just like Eve was and just like David was when he, he uh, took a census of Israel. And many people down through church history and even all of us. He hasn't, that person has not really bowed the knee to Christ because that would mean repenting of their sin of envy. And then Roman numeral five, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like you to turn to Romans, Romans chapter 13. And I know many of us are familiar with this passage. We've heard it. We've read it. We might have heard one or more messages on this. It is a challenging passage. But this this step that we're going to look at is very important once you've taken the other steps that we've talked about tonight. These other um, steps of conquering envy up to this point. If you've done that, if you've repented, if you've identified the heart problem, and then you, you repent, You now have a quickened conscience. Your heart is tender now to this 
sin of envy. You want victory over it. And the Holy Spirit is now working again. You've not quenched the power of the Spirit in your life out of repeated sin and ignoring the Holy Spirit's voice. Now you're once again sensitive to that. Your conscience is quickened and you want victory and you, you want to see consist, consistent victory. And he tells you, that is the Holy Spirit, he tells you something is leading you in the wrong direction towards sin. That is the voice of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at this passage. I'm going to start in verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Notice we, we've got those two terms right together again, strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Notice, first of all, it says, let us cast off the works of the flesh. That's, though, even the Greek word is also translated put off. Cast off, put off. It has the idea of taking off dirty clothes. And you put them aside, either to be washed or destroyed. Generally, now, now, first of all, notice what it says. Let us cast off the works of what? Darkness. Why does he use that term? Well, generally, people don't practice sin in the light where everybody can see it. They do their sin in the darkness either of privacy or where there isn't light. Just Friday, I was doing some work outside in our house, and I went over to a landscaping wall that we have there, and I noticed that one of the, the landscaping blocks had cracked. And so I took it and I replaced it with another uh, landscaping br uh, brick. And, um, and so when I, I lifted up the new one, which was setting in the dirt, I lifted it up and these varmints, <laughs> pill bugs, and many other things went scampering. Some of them adhered to the underside of the block and I was watching them as I was carrying it over to the wall. And, uh, but they were, they were trying to escape the light. And that's, the Bible describes our sin nature that way. Everybody by nature is really ashamed of the, of the darkness, of the sin that they do in the privacy or in the darkness where there is no light. And notice he says, not in revelry. Have you ever noticed how much these things do take place at darkness and not as much during the day? Not in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. These are all things that people like to hide. We don't, we don't want people to know what is really behind our behaviors that we justify or blame on others. Envy is one of those sins we don't like to acknowledge. Even if we conduct ourselves wrongly towards somebody, oftentimes we don't want them to know why we're doing it because it would be shameful to us. And in our minds, we're justifying it because of the ill feelings that we have. Strife and envy are there together. They cause the strife. Envy does. And so we have to identify the particular thoughts and behaviors of envy and, and put them off. That's, it's a purposeful thing. We're putting them off because we see them as, as dirty and sinful. 
and we don't want them anymore. They're contaminants to us. Stop, the Bible says, stop yielding your body parts as members of unrighteousness. And so stop yielding your body parts to, to envy. And then notice he says, let us put on the armor of light. Now, if you look at the test, the text, what that is, an, another phrase for that would be found in verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are synonymous. Put on the armor of light, light and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is guiding you out of the darkness of your sin nature and into the light of a Holy Spirit-empowered nature. He's guiding you into what is right. And a Christian's walk should be characterized by openness, transparency, and light. They are not afraid for their lives to be put up to the light of sincerity. And that's, that's what the word sincerity uh, really means. It comes, the etymology of the word has to do with... Um, like taking a piece of pottery. Back in the old days, they made pottery the old-fashioned way on a potter's wheel. And oftentimes when a potter had made a vessel of some sort and he put it into the kiln to be hardened so it could be used, while it was in the kiln, there might be small, just very small uh, cracks that would leak or that would compromise the integrity and it might break more easily. And so what they would do sometimes in order to hide the crack is they would fill it with, with wax. And the wax would be such that, that it would have uh, that quality that would kind of reflect the, um, the color of the pottery itself. And so when people were buying a piece of pottery, they would put it up to the sunlight and the sunlight would make the wax evident. It would, it would be a different color and the sunlight would to some degree filter through that wax and they would see that there was these small cracks in it. And so sincerity means that we're doing it with no cracks of hypocrisy, no cracks of envy, but we're doing it in full sincerity, nothing to hide. We're, we're the genuine thing. And so when we put on the armor of light, we're saying that our life is being put to the test of the light. We're different. We're living our lives for Christ. And he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying literally there is now you are, you have a different identity. Number one, you are in Christ. Now, if we're in Christ, then what do we need to put on? What he's saying there is there is a matter of cooperation with what God is saying and what we must do. And what we're to do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit that lives within us, who is the representative for Christ, is we are to yield our members, our body, as instruments of righteousness to God. And I think it's good for us to realize, to think of it this way. All besetting sin starts here in the mind. It starts by lies that we have accepted as truth. And they create strongholds in our mind that, so that we can justify our sin and blame it on our circumstances or other people or whatever. But now we've rejected that. And now we're to put on the truth of God's word. That's putting on Jesus Christ. That's one aspect of that. But another aspect of that is literally moment by moment, yielding our body to Christ. 
And that means, first of all, we yield our brain to Christ. We yield our mind so that when those, those lies flood our mind and they feel so natural because we've been doing it for so long, but we've, we've seen that it's wrong and now through repentance, the light of repentance and, and the light of the Holy Spirit, He's revealed to us that, and now we, we immediately say, Lord, I reject this as lies, and I present my mind to you now to think your thoughts, to think the truth of God's word, to think like God does, to think like Jesus Christ does. I yield my members to you right now. And friend, that is powerful. That is powerful. We, and then it says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. One man put it this way, don't pack a lunch for your sin. In other words, don't make sin easy. Make it hard. You know where your weaknesses are if you've really been honest with yourself. Therefore, you set up these uh, parameters for your sin nature. Well, I'm not going to watch that television program anymore because it's a temptation to me. It reminds me of this past sin. It's a weakness to me. And it easily becomes a God to me. I, I'm drawn to it rather than being drawn to spiritual things. See, we have to reject anything that in any way reduces our hunger for God's word and our, um, our pursuit of God. I think one of the most powerful things about living in the power of, of the Spirit is realizing the Holy Spirit is there to protect you. And it's that immediate response to that sense that you have that God is speaking to you about something instead of just going on. It's an immediate thing. Isn't that powerful that the Holy Spirit loves you that much? And if he's doing that, he is also giving you the power to obey. So stop and follow the Spirit of God. Don't keep envying. If looking at model homes in the magazine prompts you your envy, then stop it. It's hurting your contentment. It's hurting your joy in the Lord. It's, it's robbing you of that joy and rejoicing in God himself and being content in the circumstances that you find yourself in. Determine what will cultivate gratefulness and contentment. And when a thought of envy comes into your mind, cast it out right at that moment. So there's no provision for envy. You may have to evaluate your friendships. There may be friends in your life that only feed that fire. And you find a kind of a common ground there for your sin. You may have to pull away from that relationship. Or if it's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, you may have to be honest with you and say, I've really struggled with this and... Uh, this is what God has convicted me about. And I, I just can't talk about those things anymore. I realize it's, it's envy. It's wrong. Again, take care of sin immediately. Don't let it reign in your life. Keep the relationship open between you and God. Sin shall no longer have dominion over me. That's what God says in Romans 6. And then number four, commune with God often through prayer. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's what the Lord said to the disciples before he went into the Garden of Gethsemane or after he came back and he found them sleeping. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Pray while there's time. Prayer is casting your dependence on God. Prayer is admitting your weakness. I want you to turn with me now as we, we, we're coming to the close, but turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. 
in verse 1. This is the story of the adulterous woman that was caught by the Pharisees and brought before the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to read this passage and then I'm going to go back and comment on it. Verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? Caught in the very act of adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the was caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to her, Teacher, this woman was caught in the in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Everybody was gone. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Can you imagine what those words would have meant to that woman. She had just gone through one of the most humiliating circumstances that she could ever experience in life. She had been caught in this very sin, and it was a wicked sin. This very sin of adultery. And she was brought publicly out not only to be shamed, but also by the Pharisees and scribes to lay a trap for Jesus. And Jesus kind of, he just kind of went down to the ground and he began writing in the dirt. And they ask him, what should be done? And so, He says, he who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And then he went down and started writing in the dirt again. And as he was there, one by one, they all left. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is holy, pure. If anyone had the right And the justice to condemn her, it was him. I want to make it clear that he did say, go and sin no more. He identified it as sin. And Jesus in his omnipotence and his omniscience knew that this woman knew that what she had done was wrong. But when he turned to her and looked her in the eye, He said, where are your accusers? And she said, there's no one. 
And looking her in the eye, he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Think about those words, go and sin no more. You know, in essence, Jesus Christ has said that to every believer when they got saved. Whoever you were up to this point in your life, go and sin no more. How could he say that? Well, for one thing, because we aren't the same person anymore. Now, there may be things about our lives that we feel are the same. But the fact is, we're different. We have, we have forgiveness. Forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Forgiveness from God the Father. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. And now we have the Holy Spirit, God himself, taking up residence within us. We're different. Not because of us, but because of him. Sin has no more dominion over us. Jesus Christ does. And now we can surrender our members as instruments of righteousness to God. I think we need to remember that the Holy Spirit doesn't bring these things up to us to condemn us. He's bringing them up to us to guide us through the temptation so that we will be victorious because there is no temptation that is taking you but such is his common demand. But God is faithful. The Holy Spirit is faithful if we will take the route of escape. Realize that Christ is in you. Realize who you are in Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't condemning you. He's freeing us to live differently. There is power in the presence of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. You know, tonight, as we're ending, I want, I want us to sing that little chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. That's what that woman did, that adulterous woman. She looked full in the face of Christ. And that's what we need to do every day. We need to look full in the face of Jesus Christ and realize that he is our identity. We are his. We are in him. His spirit dwells within us. Sin shall no longer have dominion over me. I'm different because of him. Let's sing it together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Let's pray. Dear Father, help us to see our Savior through the eyes of faith. Help us to look full in your wonderful face. Help us to see, Lord, that in spite of our unworthiness, we are beloved by our Savior and our Father in our Holy Spirit. 
Help us to realize, Lord, that we have not been left without what we need to overcome the sin of envy. May it not have dominion over us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope that you'll be with us Wednesday night. May you have a blessed week.